Why are we, all of us, the occupants of planet Earth rushing headlong towards one precipice after another, all of which we know are there, but which we just can't bring ourselves to avoid? If we continually get right to the very edge of the drop, then surely one day we'll fall off. And if we do, humanity may be doomed. have your company here on Roundtable. I'm David Foster. Climate change, nuclear weapons, pandemics, we know they are all bad. So why on earth, quite literally, can't we see and solve the problems ahead of time? Global warming, natural disasters and global pandemics. It seems like humanity has a lot to deal with. But how much of it is actually happening because we, the human race, are unable to make long-term plans? The first UN report on the threat of climate change was in 1990, 30 years ago, but we are still debating how best to tackle it. The Spanish flu outbreak of 1918 eventually killed an estimated 40 million people. Forward to 2015 and philanthropist Bill Gates was warning that the world was not ready for the next epidemic. In the pandemic of 2020, an estimated 100 million people are being pushed into extreme poverty. The failure to plan ahead is sometimes blamed on short political cycles. Governments often last four to five years or less. But does it go deeper than that? Do we need to change to survive? Okay, time here on Roundtable to let the conversation begin to flow. We can say hello to Anders Sandberg. He's joining us from Stockholm, futurist and researcher of the Future of Humanity Institute, Oxford University. Laura Hanning, we say hello to her. She's in Vilnius in Lithuania, former climate negotiator, was vice chair of the UN Climate Adaptation Fund. And George Mickelson Foy, well, he's in New York, a writer, author of Run the Storm, a novel which explores our failure to plan. He has a keen interest in psychology, and it follows human nature. Great to have all three of you on the programme. And as I'm going to talk to you in just a moment about how we survive the end of time, if that's possible. Laura, I'm going to bring you in to say why people are so stubborn about the obvious climate problems that are facing us here as occupants of our planet. But George, let me come to you first of all. Short-termism is also known as discounting the future. Why do we do it? Well, one reason is that we are basically governed by large organizations, and large organizations such as the military, uh, government bureaucracies, large corporations, uh, work on the short term. They win battles, they win elections, they try to satisfy the next stockbroker's meeting, and the long term gets discounted as a result. There's also a, there's a, a physical reason, uh, probably in our brains, that has to do with a portion of the brain called the rostral anterior cingulate cortex, which um, makes us optimists, makes us kind of think that things are going to be all right, even though there's this big problem that intellectually we can see down the road. But um, I don't know if you remember the the scene in Annie Hall where the young uh, Woody Allen is taken to a, a psychiatrist because he won't do his homework, and the psychiatrist says, why don't you do your homework, um, uh, Alvi, in this case? And he says, well, the, the universe is expanding. What's the point? To which his mother replies, well, Brooklyn is not expanding. Well, <laughs> Woody Allen's mother, in this case, is, is us. We're... we're, we're we're fine with today and tomorrow and then the day after tomorrow. We'll, but is it also we'll, partly to do with the selfish nature that we have, that uh, what we want today is good enough for us? We know we're all going to die at some point in the nearish future. Therefore, why worry about what's going to happen down the line? I think we, intellectually, we understand we're going to die. Uh, on the day-to-day, -day, we can't really think about that too much. Otherwise, we wouldn't get up in the morning and, and make coffee. Anders, let me talk to you a little bit about this, the pandemic, uh, nuclear bombs, climate change, etc. And obviously, we'll talk to Laura in more detail about that. We know they're all bad, and yet we postpone any meaningful decisions about them until it's perhaps too late. Why? Well, <clears throat> the problem is that in many cases, we postpone the wrong things. We have handled the ozone hole to some extent, and then we build other traps. We could have avoided building nuclear bombs. However, it made sense at the time. During the Second World War, the Americans were very worried that uh, the Germans would get the bomb. 
And then they were worried, what if the Russians get the bomb and the Russians had to get the bomb because of Americans? And before you know it, you have a world armed to the teeth with weapons that could destroy it. So in this case, we built a trap for ourselves. Sometimes we make fundamental mistakes because we're too stupid. Sometimes we make fundamental mistakes because we don't know the full picture, like climate change. For the, or the, uh, a Swedish uh, researcher actually in 1903 uh, noticed that, oh, the carbon dioxide is making the world warmer. And being a Swede, he happily thought, that's great. So we don't need to do anything about that. <laughs> Later on, that turned out to be the wrong approach. And sometimes, of course, it's that we can't foresee the full consequences of new technology. Uh, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, or even social media are very hard to predict because they can be used for so many different things, both brilliant and horrifying things. So we put ourselves into this weird spot where we create a future that's getting less predictable. I'd like to bring in Laura, just so all three of you have contributed. Um, interesting that you are in Lithuania, in Vilnius. The weather there, you've said, has been like the, the Mediterranean all through this summer, and that is perhaps as a result of climate change. Indeed, surprisingly, there are so many, uh, so many Eastern Europeans who lived abroad and are now coming back to their country, partly um, because of the political situations, but partly because of the weather. And uh, you can feel it indeed that uh, when I was growing up, which was quite a few decades ago, um, we had so much snow and um, you don't see that anymore. So people do feel that climate change is happening. The only question is how to agree and what to do in order to solve it. And is that why perhaps they are so difficult to persuade? Because as George was saying, we are by nature optimists and they look at the sun um, and the blue sky in the morning and think that's a fabulous day rather than, crikey, this could be killing all of us. I think there are a couple of things to mention here. I think there is a difference between the human action on the ground, what individually do we do, and how much attention we, we pay to the issue of climate change and the international regulation. International regulation is a very different beast. It consists of politicians and technical people, negotiators, who try to achieve some meaningful agreements that will lay a foundation of framework in order to implement some action on a global scale. And that's a completely different thing. I think a lot of the people, even they feel climate change personally and believe in it, tend to, um, to have making some steps at home, um, sorting out uh, uh, waste or things like that. But you know, having a real impact, we need to address on a bigger scale. And that's where the problem lies. George, you're nodding in agreement. Yeah, that's kind of going back to what I was saying about uh, large organizations. I mean, humans are, are brilliant as that. We're explorers. We, we scan. We try to find out what's beyond the next hill. But uh, once we've done that, we tend to try to make an agrarian economy. And that brings in all kinds of other organizational issues that hamper us and, and weigh us down. I mean, I, going to specifics, uh, you know, we are able to plan. We have a lot of brilliant people, including, I think, the, uh, the two other people in this uh, program who are looking forward and trying to figure out um, solutions to uh, to this. And then when it comes down to implementing them, uh, it's a whole different story. Uh, for example, the Obama administration set up a pandemic planning uh, group within the White House or within the executive branch that came up with uh, very sound solutions to an eventual pandemic, including uh, trying to verify the data, trying to bring in uh, secure funding for personal protective equipment and an extra money for producing any kind of equipment that would be needed for vaccines and and treatments and so forth and when the trump administration came in they canceled the office they canceled the funding they they just ignored it and this is uh, i don't want to compare it to obama and trump too much but this is a kind of administrative thing that will get in the way of the people who are looking forward to what might be coming uh, what might be happening sh sh shall we go back to the to you refer to as our experts here trying to get global change and ask them whether they think you, you first Laura, if i may do you feel perhaps that you are fighting a losing battle in the sense that people aren't interested necessarily in what happens way down the line oh absolutely i think what we're coming against is talking from the uh, global regulation perspective where we need really a uh, laws and regulations to address 
uh, industry, uh, uh, oil consumption and, and things like that. Uh, then you have a problem of really political cycles. Whilst addressing the issues such as climate change will take decades, our political cycles typically in democracies are between four and five uh, years. As a result, politicians flag the most pertinent issues that they can solve within that cycle. As a result, climate change or putting infrastructure that would be in a different direction to what the lobby groups are advocating, whether we have very strong coal lobby groups in Australia and therefore very limited climate action we see there on the basis of international regulation. This is where we have this problem. There's dichotomy of uh, uh, political cycles and the action, long-term action needed in order to solve the problems we have at stake. So Anders, um, if mankind is doomed to repeat the same mistakes, do you ever feel yourself like in trying to sort out ways to, to save humanity, if that's not too big a way of describing what, what you're doing, that um, you, as a sense, kind of what you're doing is doomed? Do. Sorry? Yeah, I, I think in the really, really long run, everything is doomed because of the heat death of the universe, but that is quadrillions and quadrillions of years in the future. The near term is up to us. And I think there is good reasons uh, to be optimistic, actually. Yes, governments are short-sighted, but many politicians, when you talk to them, they want to be uh, long-range. They want to actually do things. And they say, if only the voters would let us. And then you talk to the voters, and it turns out that voters actually say, yeah, we really would like to have long-term as politicians. It might be the parties in the middle that are creating institutional trouble. It's possible to find ways around many of these uh, things. Uh, for example, we reduced the risk of nuclear war quite significantly simply by adding the red phone between Washington and Kreml. It's a simple technical device that reduces the risk of a big mistake uh, a fair bit. Now, an even bigger reduction would be, of course, various forms of test bans and uh, proliferation agreements. Similarly, artificial intelligence is right now not dangerous. But it might quite uh, become quite dangerous in the long run if it's powerful and we don't have good ways of making it safe. So we are actually trying to develop uh, safety measures right now. Anders, um, Anders I'm going to stop you there because I think Laura wanted to, to, to jump in. Yeah, I completely agree with Anders. The only problem that I see or uh, an experience on the ground is a classical prisoner's dilemma. All of these politicians, let's hope, are rational, just as the voters are. The problem is that even the rational people might not cooperate in order to achieve their required results because the, the cost is quite big. The, there are so many uh, impediments in order to achieve progress, such as, for example, even in the negotiations context, you would have different size of countries. They would have different priorities. For example, some countries have a priority to protect their um, oil trade as opposed to protect like Maldives, not to be underwater in a couple of years. And then the big countries have other priorities. There are countries or stakeholders in the negotiations trying to agree something international. They also have a different power because of the size or what position they take. So China, for example, will have much more power and say how the agreements will look like um, as opposed to a German NGO or small NGO. Yeah, which Seven sort of brings us back to what George was saying earlier on about it's the larger organisations that have the muscle and the push to be able to determine exactly where we're going. I'm wondering, George, whether the uh, the prisoner's dilemma that uh, Laura's referring to there is the same as the, the, the tragedy of the commons, where, if, if you like, there's one tree left in the forest, and the I choice has to be, do I cut that tree down and it helps me float off to safety, or do I leave that tree there so we will have more trees in the future? Well, I think there's a little bit of optimism in what Laura was saying, <clears throat> in that individuals and sort of the explorer part of our psyche uh, is aware of stuff and wants to take care of it. And it's it's hampered by the power structures that we've had for la the last 10,000 years growing and growing to the point now where they're enormous. But there is a little bit of hope. And I'm, I'm bringing it back to specifics. My, my field of investigation was really hurricanes, which are a function to some extent of, of climate change, but they're another complex system that is that is lethal, that is one of the hugest, most destructive uh, forces in nature that we, we, we're trying to understand. We can't fully understand it, but we try to plan for it. And, um, and, rise, and the rising water the, that comes with climate change is another example of that. Um, and again, the short-term uh, short priorities are, uh, would, would seem to 
militate for trying to build, for example, big dikes around New York. There's, there's one called the Big U that is supposed to be built. All the funding is gone. Because and, and there's an example of where that was done. That was 1953. That was in the Netherlands after massive flooding there, huge loss of life. They did do something successfully. Why don't other people follow that example? Well, this is the optimistic side of it, is that when, when people are on the ground and they're dealing with their community and they have to save their community, as in Holland after 53 and since then, the, the, the Dutch system of, of, of uh, flood control uh, comes down to what they call water boards, Vatoschappen, which are small community, well, relatively small community boards that are in charge of defending their part of Holland. And they've done a really amazing job. Uh, of protecting Holland. And maybe the solution here comes down to really giving more power to, to the local communities who are dealing with hurricanes, dealing with climate change, and have to do something about it, or they're not going to survive, like the Maldives, as Laura was saying. And Anders, yeah, I think you wanted to say something. Sorry, I'll be back with you in a minute, Laura. Uh, there, <clears throat> there is both uh, a benefit in bottom-up solutions, where small communities come together and solve things. But for some problems, you need the top-down solutions, like the banning uh, chlorofluorocarbons understanding which problem requires which solution, and also testing out new forms of solutions is really important. One of the cool things about being human is that we are fairly smart and we have a cumulative culture. We come up with solutions and see what past solutions have failed or succeeded and can imitate them rather effectively. So I think there is a good reason to think that we are every day solving some of the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons problems. Not perfectly, not well enough, but we're getting better at it, I think. So we aren't doomed. No, I don't think so. <laughs> not till we are not doomed. But um, I must say a little bit on more on a pessimistic side. I think all these examples that have been given, they're brilliant. However, they are rather small in terms of the scale of uh, what has been done and the action is needed. And um, I think achieving uh, uh, an effort to, to really fight climate change and make this this planet livable in a long term, uh, there needs to be more to be done. And as uh, Anders mentioned, more innovative solutions. And this is where I actually, on a positive note, I believe that innovation technologies and business is what is key. It's, it's communities are great. Um, community action is amazing. It's needed as well yeah. as international regulation. But I think we need that human mind that you know, uh, my fellow speakers are, are, are studying and looking into in order to have that ingenuity to come up with solutions that are grand on scale, both in framework, in function, and what they can do. But there aren't in enough hours way. in the day, perhaps. And when the pandemic came along, Laura, um, you must have been thinking, crikey, I've got to keep myself and my family safe. But as a climate negotiator, you must also perhaps have been thinking, oh, no, now what I really concern myself with on a day-to-day -day basis is going to the back of the queue. Yeah, th this is really uh, sad. However, I think um, once we put this question on our agenda, which already is, it's not at the forefront, but we are working on it. And the more freedom we have around the world, and it's so interesting how all these issues are very combined. Having democracy allows people freedom of thought. And it's it's not the pandemic that worries me more that it will overshadow the climate change, but what is happening around the world right now and the suspension of freedom of people and um, people are not having ideas coming into life. There is only few hotspots where you have innovation. There is no transfer of uh, intellectual property. So this is, this is very important. Everything has to happen at the same time but I want more people to be educated, to be free, and to be able to come up with those solutions. And that needs freedom of thought and democracy. And will, will that save us, George? I think <clears throat> we don't know. I think this is an existential question that has really come to the fore with this, with this century, with the 21st century. We, we are really come up, coming up against a time when we will determine humanity's fate, whether we survive or not. But I think Laura and Anders have both uh, talked about that that interface between um, international efforts and community organization that does have a potential to hopefully, you know, deal with problems like certainly like climate change, like hurricanes, and in, in the case of my expertise, and it, it, we'll have to see we'll have to see what happens. But I, you know, democracy, the freedom of thought, and again, the uh, community 
involvement in, in processes uh, of defense against uh, climate change and so forth are, are crucial. But and unless we'll you have forward-thinking leaders in place around the world, and I mean, at any one time, the chances of that happening are, are pretty slim, you aren't going to get concerted global action because of the short-term nature of their careers. I, I think it seems pretty impossible. And this is where, dare I interject, this is where business plays a massive role. This is where you have, you know, no matter, despite the noise that politicians create, and I talked about their political cycles, that hinder really the progress or long-term thinking on the uh, nation, let alone international uh, level, this is where you can come up with ideas of how to adapt to climate change, how to uh, create carbon sinks, what could be the solutions that um, could make it and achieve faster uh, results towards climate change. And as existential matters that we're talking about, what do you think the next major catastrophe to come around? This is in your position as a futurist. We've talked about nuclear weapons, we've talked about climate change, we, we've talked about pandemics. What, what next do we need to be avoiding, if we can? Well, uh, I think uh, on my li top uh, five list of scary things that keeps me mildly up at night, uh, uh, besides uh, the risk of pandemics and uh, nuclear war, I do think we need to handle the power of biotechnology because we are probably going to make big mistakes with that and be better people. We have issues. Sorry, a little bit difficult to hear you. The, the power of Sorry. biotech. Yeah, which is both a solution to many of these problems. With enough biotechnology, we can fix uh, pandemics. Unfortunately, it also makes it easier to make bioweapons. And no doubt, some people are going to be using it in misguided ways. Similarly, artificial intelligence, even if it's not terribly smart, it would enable, for example, massive surveillance and various forms of totalitarian solutions that we definitely want to avoid. And really powerful artificial intelligence can both be used maliciously or accidentally go off and do very dangerous things. So these are issues we need to deal with that emerge from new technologies that we don't quite have yet and we don't fully understand, which makes it tricky to fix. It's sometimes easier to say, oh dear, we polluted our environment. We need to stop polluting and get rid of those pollutants. But we also need to be proactive. The good news is, I think as a species, we are getting better at it. 200 years ago, we didn't know ecology was a thing. 200 years ago, the United Nations would have been unthinkably crazy in a, in a utopia. Today, we have ecology. It's not good enough, but we're getting there. The United Nations exists and is doing some good. And I think if we survive 200 more years, we are going to have even better forms of coordination, even better forms of tech transfer. It's just that we need to get there. That means dodging probably both a few uh, the, 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 the obvious risks like climate change and a few nasty surprises that we will look back and say, but why didn't anybody write a novel about that? Why didn't anybody see <laughs> that stamps well, that were the real problem? Perhaps, George, you already you have. Uh, I, I suppose what I want to say is it's a jolly good job, from what I've heard on this programme, that we do, as a species, have hard wiring to be optimistic. Well, <clears throat> obviously, that's it's good and it's also... Uh, there's also a bad aspect <laughs> to that. But uh, getting back to specifics, I hate to keep harping on this, but I, I do think, I mean, we have a possible future that will end with our extinction as a species and then a possible future where we learn to deal with these complex systems. And we can't understand fully. We can never understand fully a complex system like even a hurricane or, or a global warming or a population explosion. Uh, all of this stuff is really beyond our ability to to understand entirely and deal with completely. Okay, but I think we'll have to go into this on another occasion as well. And, and as I said, we'd talk about your solution to the end of time on this programme. Come back on another day and we, we will do that. Because I want to ask... We um, will have time. Yeah. Laura, a slightly facetious question. As a climate change activist, would you rather stay in Vilnius with the beautiful blue skies and sunshine and spring-like Mediterranean weather, or would you be happier as a human being if it started to snow again? I must say, I miss snow a lot, and there is nothing more beautiful than white Christmas. So, if I could, I would change it around and I would be eight years old again. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, and, George, you, you've talked about the capability of humans to ad adapt. Are you, by nature, one who believes that we as a species will survive and get through all of this? Uh, by nature, I, I am someone who hopes, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a bit worried 
about uh, like the Woody Allen character, or actually about Dustin Hoffman and The Graduate. I'm a little worried about our future. But as a skier, I definitely hope we can reverse things because I, I miss snow a lot. OK, final quick one. And as, I mean, from what you've been saying, there is a doomsday coming at some point. We can dodge it to a certain extent. That's for another day. But you smile as though you believe we can be saved. Yeah, I'm an optimist. I think there are solutions, and I'm also optimistic that we can find them. Maybe I'm wrong, but what do we have to lose? Thank you very, very much indeed. I wish we could go on for a great deal longer, but uh, time is our enemy, as it is uh, for mankind. Great to have you all on the programme. Perhaps we'll see you again on another occasion. I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. And thank you, wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable. There are so many more, and you can find them on our YouTube channel. That's TRT World YouTube Roundtable. From me, David Foster, until next time, goodbye.